Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, um, uh, webinar. This uh, webinar will focus on the global digital futures um, and we are discussing it in the framework of the project that um, uh, Foresight Center at the Estonian Parliament is uh, running. Um, the project focuses on the global balance of power, but among other issues we are focusing on the digital um, challenges uh, that we are seeing in the global politics and global economy. When we look at um, trends that have been shaping digitalization, then I think in the last uh, 20 years or so, we have been seeing increasing platformization. So uh, instead of sort of decentralized, uh, loose network uh, of internet that we were talking about in the 1990s, increasingly we have seen the rise of uh, large digital platforms and those platforms um, primarily come from the united states but they are increasingly uh, being um, challenged uh, by the chinese digital platforms and that has also led to the number of uh, tensions on the global scale that affects uh, global trade that affects uh, global politics uh, that affects uh, um, all the economies and countries around the world. And now in this uh, situation of pandemic and economic crisis, um, obviously some of those trends that we have seen before are uh, strengthened and others are weakened. And in this um, session, in this webinar, we're actually going to discuss some of those issues. Uh, what are some of the developments that we can see emerging uh, in the crisis and after the crisis uh, and our perspective is sort of 15 years ahead and I have very distinguished panel uh, here that has uh, joined me. I have Professor Martin Kenny uh, from University of California Davis who is um, also director at the Berkeley Roundtable on International Economy. Martin is also editor of research policy which is uh, um, an important uh, leading journal uh, in the field and also has published uh, and edited a number of books, uh, scholarly articles and so on. Then um, uh, in addition to Martin, I'm joined by uh, Kai Chia, who is associate professor at uh, University for Electronic Sciences and Technology of China. Uh, Guy joins us from uh, Chengdu, uh, China. Uh, Guy has also published uh, on Chinese and uh, um, US uh, digital platforms. Uh, he has been a visiting scholar at University of uh, California, Davis. And uh, Guy is a graduate of uh, uh, Tsinghua University in China. In addition to uh, uh, Guy, I'm also joined by uh, uh, Ravi Chaturvedi uh, from Fletcher School as um, Institute for Business uh, in the Global Context. Ravi um, has published um, uh, in uh, Harvard Business Review. Uh, in addition to scholarly uh, achievements, he has wor worked uh, for a number of multinationals, uh, SBC, Hewlett Packard, American Express, and he has also been advising Estonian government on new residency. So uh, welcome, uh, Ravi. And then um, um, uh, we have also um, with us a cybersecurity expert, uh, Merle Maigra, who uh, is a vice president of Cyber Technologies, has also been a, a director of the NATO Cyber Center here in Tallinn, has been a national security advisor to uh, President Kaljulaid and also President Ilves, worked in the NATO headquarters uh, in the office of uh, previous Secretary General um, Rasmussen. Welcome Merle. And um, from the Estonian policy makers uh, perspectives, uh, uh, we welcome reflections from Andrei Koropeinik, uh, who is a member of the Estonian parliament. He's also uh, deputy chairman of the Center Party's uh, parliamentary faction in the Estonian parliament. And Andre uh, is not just a policymaker, but actually has a practical experience in building up digital companies. So in the 
um, in, in, in his previous uh, work, he built up one of the, um, or the most successful social networking, uh, Estonian social, social networking uh, uh, company here, rate.ee, and he has also been involved in a number of other uh, startup companies and advised uh, many, uh, many other companies and invested in many of them as well. So Andre, uh, welcome uh, to this uh, uh, webinar. So um, with, without further ado, I would like to give a floor to uh, Martin. So Martin, please, the uh, floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Milis. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the work that John Zeisman and I and others have been doing on the, uh, the rise of the digital platform economy. And Melis asked me to think about this in the post-COVID environment. So uh, let me just, without further ado, uh, move forward. Uh, so first of all, the way we think about this is that we're in a reorganization of the capitalist economy, which, within which the digital platform owners are developing power that is stronger than that of the factory owners in the Industrial Revolution, or even Ford with his assembly line. We can consider data as the new oil. It's, it's a metaphor, right? I don't want to push that too far. And algorithms, and now if you want to add in AI, are the machines that refine that oil and extract value. So that's sort of the big context here, and I'll return to that uh, again uh, later. So the COVID crisis, of course, is not only about COVID, it's also about the serial, serial bubbles that financialization has caused. caused. <clears throat> this is the subject of another talk, right? But uh, I think we need to put that in a context, the context of WeWork, the context of all these bubbles that were starting to collapse, and then we get hit by COVID. Uh, so also the economy was already being rewired through the mega platform firms, which I'll discuss again a little later. And during the COVID crisis, they have only improved their positions. I mean, in fact, we're here on Zoom, right? Uh, Google didn't buy Zoom. Perhaps that was a mistake uh, because they certainly considered it. It just came out recently in, in one of the uh, trade presses, right? So I would argue that capitalism's experience a, a profound transformation. Crises equal change periods. From 29 to 1945, we had a Great Depression. Which were the firms that came through that very successfully. Uh, GM, Ford, the mass production firms during that Great Depression uh, did very well. Uh, Germany, of course, was Volkswagen uh, um, under Hitler, of course. There was also a climate crisis in the United States, which led to mass unionization. The other crisis we sometimes think about is 74, 1980, where the oil firms reasserted their, asserted their power Finally, it was the oil firms that became the powerful uh, uh, firms. And of course, out of this comes Reagan financialization. In the United States context, the decline of manufacturing deunionization. So 2008 is, a, I guess, a nice time to think about when the platform firms start to become the focus of power in the US, and I would argue in the, in the world, uh, outside X China, which Kai will talk about, but China, of course, gets its platform firms, and they really start to take off 2008, 2009, with the rise of the smartphone. But Kai will discuss that in, in greater detail. Um, let's just look at stock market capitalization here. And I put 1955 there to give you the old America, the America coming out of the Great Depression. And you see, of course, the oil companies are already important, but the company that's on top is General Motors, followed by U.S. Steel, General Electric, Esmark, which is now gone, which was a steel services company, Chrysler, Armor Meats, um, Gulf Oil, Mobil, and DuPont, the chemical company. This was an America that made things. Uh, by 2002, right, think about Reagan and the, uh, and what do you have? to the rise to the top. You have one platform firm, Microsoft. Then you still have General Electric, Exxon, Walmart, Citigroup, J&J, &J, uh, Johnson & Johnson, right? 
So what you see is a relatively variegated economy, but it's both oil and knowledge-based firms in one platform. January 2020, let's do a fast forward, and the top five firms in valuation globally are uh, platform firms. One Chinese platform firm, uh, five American platform firms, Microsoft surviving the shakeout, Visa, which is a different kind of platform firm, and then Tencent, right? Fa flash forward to May 2020, it becomes really interesting, right? By May 2020, we've had a stock market collapse and a bounce back to some degree, and we see a changing, but now we see seven platform firms as the most valuable firms in the world. I'm leaving the uh, Saudi Arabian oil company off, off this, right? The, but what we also see is some switching of places. What we see is Amazon has been moving up. Amazon has captured the most uh, value or, or is most valuable. So Amazon has moved up significantly which is of course what we know. Amazon is becoming the delivery platform of choice. So what's the argument here? The argument is quite simply that today from the stock market's perspective, the most valuable firms in the world are the platform firms. Go back to 1955 and the most valuable firms in the world with the exception of in the United States. I, I don't have, I couldn't find the global statistics are of course manufacturing firms with the exception of the oil the oil giants so what do we need to understand here as we are all using zoom uh, which is of course a platform uh, what do we find we find that the most powerful i'm talking only about the u.s platforms there are no european platforms that would show up here there would be chinese platforms but essentially they're uh, China, and these firms are more or less rest of the world. You have a set of firms that connect 2 billion people, more or less, and then you go down and you have the small Amazon marketplace, 300 million, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what is the point here? These firms have become the firms that knit together the world with the exception of China, Iran, and a few other countries, uh, China in particular. Okay, so this is just a, a slide. It's a little bit dated now, but really it is um, the monthly active users by date of introduction. I put this in a straight line because I don't have enough points to create a, 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 a curve, which is of course what it would be, uh, is an exponential curve. But what I'd like you to just look at the Google properties here and see that many of them are in the 1.5, 2 billion. It's a little dated it, and I should uh, update it. Well, the other thing I'd like to show you is Google Drive, which is introduced in 2016, which goes, it's now over a billion users. Uh, that's in uh, four years, right? So what we have is the incredible scale, scope, and speed with which platform firms can enter the marketplace. And of course, the other thing that we have here is these mega platform firms, Google, Amazon, Facebook, lesser extent, Microsoft, that have many, many platforms under their, uh, under their aegis of their firm, which again shows you the power. And uh, we recently saw the revenue numbers for all of these firms. Uh, the the um, the Q1 revenue numbers, and they were they were really quite impressive when you look at every uh, basically every other firm in the economy except perhaps some pharma, uh, and what their revenues numbers were. And you could obviously the collapse of the oil giants shows also that energy and oil I think are decreasing in their power in the global global economy. So I want to talk a little bit about competition. This is a very busy slide, uh, but there, what, I, what I'm arguing here is that there's a shift in intersectoral power in the economy that is being accelerated by COVID, right? I think that's the interesting thing, that COVID, instead of 
sort of damping down these platforms has actually um, increased their power, sped them up. So if you think about if you were in the movie theater business today, that's probably not a great business to be in. But if you're in a platform delivering entertainment, be it Netflix, which is not really a platform in the two-sided market sense of the term, but you could think about Netflix, or you think about YouTube, right? And what we see is that they've increased their power relative to other players. Uh, Chinese payment systems, and Kai will talk about this, are becoming a duopoly. But what's so interesting here is, uh, once again, in this marketplace, the platforms in China, I'm sure, are strengthening themselves versus cash. All right. Visa is strengthening itself. Apple Pay is strengthening itself. Right. So we're starting to see these shifts that are going to affect not only merchants in general, but banks. And I'm, I would argue that COVID has simply accelerated that. Amazon is becoming the dominant retailer. Right? COVID has accelerated that. Read Jeff Bezos' Q1 letter, his most recent letter to his shareholders. It's remarkable. He is basically saying we are going to mobilize in this, in this crisis to help society. Okay. But also in this mobilization, Amazon is going to be even more strengthened when we come out of this, right? So, so that's sort of a reflection of COVID and the platforms, right? And what we know is that industry boundaries are being blurred due to software, right? And I, I would argue that this is happening, e once again, even more as we're in the COVID crisis. And when we come out the other side, and we will, I mean, I think already, thankfully, you in Northern Europe, uh, perhaps with the exception of Sweden, are on your way out of the crisis, things are going to be shifted once again. Um, and, and we need to think about that. And in general, what we've seen from the platforms is that value, they are, they are becoming new intermediaries in almost every value chain and segmenting, reintegrating, and shifting these value chains. And we're starting, we've got some papers that I'll come to at the end that start to think through this. But, but this process, as I said before, is, is accelerating. So the power of a business and a technology is most evident, right, when uh, subjects feel they have no choice but to join the technology, right, join this. So my mother is 90, 99 now, uh, is going to have to start ordering on Amazon or we will order for her. She used to like to go pay in cash. This is changing. So how do we need to think about this? Does a business exist if it cannot be found on Google search? Again, X china right? And therefore you have to advertise on this. And this is becoming again, even more reinforced in periods of lockdown. Now I have this old one, can a restaurant be found? It's not on Google Maps, maybe when we come out of the lockdown, but right, does a small business have to be on Amazon today? These are the kinds of questions that are being addressed, that were already being addressed, and I think are just being accelerated. So as we think about <clears throat> apps for uh, COVID, for uh, tracking, et cetera, et cetera, for disease tracking, carrier tracking, contact tracking, right? These are being offered by who? Apple and Google. I'm not saying one shouldn't adopt them, but what I'm saying is that these then provide even more data and information to the, uh, to the platforms, perhaps to the governments too. And we could discuss, right, the linkage between governments and, and platforms, right? And of course, every, as we know, everything digital leaves a record. So the actions that are visible to the one owning the platform, right? And right, the privacy uh, regulations that were at least discussed in Europe 
and in the United States and in partly in force now in this crisis are being eroded. Well, what does that mean, right? And these data can be analyzed for patterns. So if it's uh, contact tracking, right, violating perhaps the privacy restrictions of Europe, uh, then can those be used for other things, right? The data can be used to manage and discipline people, to reorganize activities, to enter new markets, shift where value is captured. All of these things are on the agenda and the mega platforms are becoming more and more powerful in, in this process. So when thinks about today, the mega platform Google and Google Travel versus booking.com, well, all you, could, all you can do is sell your booking.com stock because Google is going to come after them, right? So we may see an even greater concentration out of the smaller platforms into the larger platforms. And again, will COVID cause this? No, but I think COVID becomes the lever for this. So, so I, I would argue that COVID is accelerating the power centralization to the platforms. Some new entrances, Zoom are having success, while other platforms, of course, are having serious trouble. I mean, you know, Airbnb, Uber, Lyft, and many of the other sharing platforms. Online work and income generation is increasing, right? Which means it's going to go through various platforms, right? So as we work increasingly for home, from home, and some of that work may not come back to the office, what does that mean? Will this contribute to inequality? There's already a problem as we centralize more and more economic activity through a few mega platforms. Will this increase inequality? If so, how? So the big unknowns here, the mega platforms will survive and comparatively thrive in the economic downturn. I think that's already, that's already um, baked in. We know this. Uh, what happens to small business that becomes even more dependent on platforms? So increasingly, if you have to sell through Amazon, right, what will that mean? Or if you have your own website and your back end, which is becoming the platform back end, is Shopify. What does that mean when Shopify becomes the dominant back end for, for websites? What does that mean for where wealth is accumulated and captured? And what does that mean for the rest of our societies? So that's sort of a few thoughts that I have. Uh, with that, uh, they've got, there's some papers here that are online uh, that I'm sure you can, uh, the slides will be shared and you're, you're welcome to uh, go look at them. And with that, I'll end. And Melis, if we have time for questions, fine. If not, uh, you're the uh, you're the boss. Tell me what's next. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Martin. Um, actually, you already have two questions in the Q and A section, but uh, we can come back to that um, during our discussion. And alternatively, you can also actually answer uh, to them in the Q and A section by writing your answers. But we, we will do okay. that. In the, we will do qu questions. Uh, in the discussion part because we do have quite a lot of uh, presenters. And so uh, with that, I will go from the west coast of US to Chengdu, China, and offer uh, opportunity to uh, Kai Chia to talk about Chinese platforms and what might be the potential sort of future developments, um, uh, particularly in the context of uh, COVID-19. So Kai, uh, floor is yours. Uh, you can share your slides. Uh, Mark Martin, you have to stop sharing uh, uh, the screen. Guy can do that. Please turn on your mic as well, Guy. Your yeah. mic is not. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, uh, so salesman, salesman is, uh, yeah. Um, and thanks, Martin, for the presentation and uh, thanks for the invitation. It, it's it's great to join in the discussion about uh, um, about the post crisis. Maybe what 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 will happen for the global uh, for the global digital world. And uh, well, my brief introduction will cover will basically cover some uh, some latest data 
which I think is a very up, uh, very um, uh, very good uh, explanation explanation of what it, what, what happens uh, during the whole process um, before the crisis and after crisis. Um, and then we uh, and then I will talk about some some discussions or, or pr propose some questions which also can be related to the uh, to what Martin has already proposed. So. Um, basically, the data is from the latest uh, Senate 54th report of the of the whole nation uh, of the of China. So it's from we we will compare from the uh, from two at the end of 2019 and to and as of the March 2020. So as you can see that there are, uh, there have already been nine uh, uh, nearly nearly so it's 900 million netizens all over the all, all over the country and the age structure is very interesting so that um, um so, so that the people between 50 and 59 or which you can say it's the elder people that uh, that, that there are already left 35.5 percent is concerned especially the elder people that they are still offline. Uh, and before the, the crisis, I think most of the um, most of the scholars or the, the, the businessmen consider that they are not important because they, they will not get in get connected for the elder people. There are lots of problems for them to you know, lots of the obstacles for them to get connected. But after the crisis, as Martin has already proposed, it accept it accelerated the whole process. More people will be, and the, even the elder people has to has to be collected because they have to show their, uh, we were told it today in nature, they will show their digital code to prove that they are not from the, uh, the, the, the high risk, high, so, so the high risk district. So they have to prove themselves using the digital code. So they has to be collected. And the, the left 35% of the people who is offline will become the new field for the business uh, competition. And as, and as um, next, we will talk, I will talk about some, uh, is, explain the different uh, industry by industry. For, um, before, the, before the crisis, as we can see that because of the penetration has already been high and uh, the market has already been mature. So the, the many industry has already, been, uh, has already been through a very steady improvement for the instant message. For example, the mobile instant message user still uh, has uh, it's nearly 100 percent of the, of the latest of the latest. and for the mobile news app, for example, the tip for another the total the bad dance, the bad dance, the tip talk, um, that is the this kinds of apps. The user the user still is also um, mature, but and the mobile payment as Martin has already proposed the mo the mobile payment has already increased from from 73% to 85% uh, during the during the pro during the crisis as many people st stops those um, go to the supermarkets go to the retailers to pay tax um, more and more businesses are, are conducted online and so the mobile payment becomes uh, becomes a major um, major channel for that kind of things and the e-commerce as well as, as you can expect it, it's also increased from 73% to 78%. And food delivery, so it's, uh, so for the, for there, so for the, for the food delivery, it's, it's, uh, uh, we, we don't say it's a crisis for them. It's not because of the digital platform, it's because of the offline, offline restaurants. Most of, many restaurants are closed. So the food delivery platform cannot be uh, cannot provide as much food as it used to be. And on the other hand, many people stay at home. They treat themselves. So the food delivery platform, the mobile food delivery platform, in, in China, the mostly used is Meituan and Olm, which belongs to Ten, which has a close relationship with Tencent and Alibaba, respectively. So the food delivery platform uh, has been through. Uh, some trouble, but not that much compared with online traveling and red hailing. So you can see online traveling, boot, uh, online traveling, uh, the uh, online traveling apps, for example, the sea trip has already been through a decrease from 48% to 41%. And for red hailing, for DD, uh, it's also been through a very sharp or uh, 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 relatively limited, uh, re a relatively limited decrease. And, but on the other hand, there are new industries emerging from the on online education and mobile online game 
and also the broadcasting, as we were told. This, these three kinds of industries are very shiny. You can see the shiny stuff for the online education, also the online conference. And um, uh, it's different from room that is maybe we can say it's an independent uh, platform, but in China that most of, most of us are using the uh, the online conference from Tencent or uh, and Alibaba. So they they two those two um, digital those two we uh, we wrote some, we wrote a paper with Martin uh, uh, about the platform business group uh, in China. So you, it proves it again the. Uh, the online education or the online conference uh, company doesn't come from independent independent source, but from a company from a product produced by Alibaba or Tencent. Um, and the mobile online game, online game, so you you, know, you can guess, you can it, it it's you, you can expect that it will go through it will be through a um a in, a increase. And the broadcasting is also a new industry. Despite that, um, it has already been. It has has already been popular popular for some year, uh, two years ago. But at present, broadcasting has already been through a, a huge increase, especially for the e-commerce. Many people, it, it, many people becomes, or you can say, the many um, many internet internet as we can say, internet celebrities, internet celebrities has has already come out and to introduce to to share what they feel about the product and to advertise the product. And it has already, it has already been a new, uh, new trend in Chinese digital economy. So uh, from the business side, that we, if we compare this, um, the, the different kinds of industry, which has already been through a crisis, through the crisis and compared to the uh, industries which has been through a growth that it's, it's uh, it's obvious for the sharing economy, for the online travel, and for, for the food delivery, there have already been some crisis. And for even for the AI industry, um, uh, and although there is no clear data for that, but uh, from the from my experience and from my understanding of the of industry, still um, uh, it has been some crisis because most of the AI uh, application in China nowadays is offline for the supermarkets for the train station for the airports but most of the um, um, most of the offline um, environments has already been closed so the AI industry still uh, is it all is also been through a crisis but uh, compared to that the growth for the online education online conference payments games and broadcasting has already been some very um, uh, has already been through a major growth at present um, take the broadcasting for example. So, uh, despite there are, uh, 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 besides the internet said said writing has already been existing for a long time, there are more and more offline uh, offline businesses have really been turned into online be, um, um, using the using the broadcasting. For example, I the the, the example I take here is a is a restaurant is a is a is a is a, uh, is a, is a restaurant chain and they. Move to the off to the online using the broadcasting to introduce his um, products, and it's uh, uh, and it has already been a great success. So there are some discussions, for, three discussions I want to propose for that. The first is about the increased penetration. So people will be more digitalized, especially those who are offline at present. So uh, uh, as I, as we mentioned, so before. Crisis. We all we consider that the elder people is not our tar, is not the target of the digital businesses. But uh, at present, we can say that more. Uh, we can say that um, more and more industries or more and more um, platforms started to concentrate on these kinds of offline people. And the second discussion is about the new normal. So the digital transformation of of traditional businesses has already been accelerated. For example, the retainers, the restaurants, and even the films. So um, there is a you know, example for the films. So um, before that, the cinemas people go to the cinemas to enjoy the films. But during the you, you know this Chinese uh, this year the Chinese uh, Spring Festival, we are uh, usually it will be a huge um, a huge business for the for the cinemas. But uh, because of the crisis, that the cinemas are, are closed down. So many films cannot be shown on, uh, in the cinemas. So there are very few films moved to, the on, moved to move online on TikTok, on, 
on 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 the on on some very sh on 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 other short video and platforms. So they demonstrate and it has already and uh, it has already provided some very great shots to the traditional industry, film industry. And the third one is the digital platform business group, Alibaba and Tencent are limited affected because, they are, because of their diversity, diversification. And on the other hand, they are even, they are even, uh, they, they even gained more competence compared to the small businesses. And there are also other um, changes on the, um, besides the business side. It's mostly, mostly I will talk about the governance side. So it's about the digital contact tracing. So, uh, uh, so, so as as you can see, uh, it has already been um, it has already been popular all through the world. But in China, that it has already been very popular or very familiar with every people. And on one side, on one hand, that it increased the penetration rate. On the other hand, it increased the data sharing between uh, different kinds of uh, different uh, companies and even between um, the government and the companies. So, so. Um, as we can see that um, before crisis, the digital platform, one of the um, difficulties for the digital companies is that they cannot, um, they cannot share the data with each other and they cannot connect data um, from, dif from different kinds of sources. So they have to expand horizontally to cover different kinds of industry to, um, to, to, to have a big picture of the whole people, uh, to, uh, of the whole environment. But, uh, and under, under the crisis, uh, to, uh, under the crisis, the process, the, the process of data sharing and data connection has already been accelerated. So it has, you know, so it's a big, it's a major change. And on the other hand, says that the Chinese government has already started a new project, a, a new, you can say, it's a new project means that the new infrastructure focusing on three kinds of infrastructures: the information, the mixture, and the innovation. And they invest, there are 40 trillion RMB investments on that kind of things. So one, uh, so the other and, 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 and proposition is that what we are, there have been new um, digital platforms because of the new infrastructure, for example, AI, 5G or blockchain. And what the, uh, what the uh, incumbents um, will be, how their incumbents will be affected because of the new infrastructure. So, uh, and the problem, uh, as for the third question is about the prospects for the digital futures, I think there are two alternatives that we can propose. For the first one is the alternatives to the dichotomy of government and private, uh, uh, and the private analysis. So uh, some will argue that uh, either the government will uh, in charge or will dominate the future or the private will dominate, private digital platforms will, will dominate the future. but. Uh, on the, uh, from the example of China, of, of China um, that we can say, for example, take the digital contact tracing as an example. It's not, it's neither the government nor the private. It's a, it's a cooperation between these two. But there are also proposed some new problems. So, um, for example, the, um, how can we balance the benefits and costs? It, it seems that for the government, they have huge amounts of data, but who has the right to talk to to who has the right to get access to the data and by what kind of principle uh, that the government can allow the access. So it has already been a huge, um, a huge problem and there, uh, there are many discussions in China about the kinds of mechanisms. And there are, the second the dis, dis alternative is about the alternative to the digital platforms. So, um, and the traditional, during the process, uh, the traditional industry has already been digital uh, digitalization and during the process where digital giants still dominate uh, or more digital giants emerge because, because of the new infrastructure and uh, the second question is about where the digital giants become more localized by um, by being localized it means extending to the rural places instead of in the major cities major urban places so th there are so these are also some changes that might happen after the crisis um, Okay, so that is a, a brief inter, uh, introduction about uh, changes between um, before the crisis and after crisis and some of my uh, thoughts on this kind of things. So thanks many. That's all on my um, uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Kai. Uh, thanks for uh, bringing it uh, to the sort of potential future scenarios, whether it will be dominance of uh, 
private platforms, dominance of uh, governments or dominance of sort of uh, uh, public-private partnership, and you kind of argued that the latter is true for uh, China. We can discuss it later, whether it's uh, true also for other countries. Uh, but before we go to the discussion, we also have a few presentations. Uh, Guy, you also have one question already in Q&A section. If you want to, you can answer to that uh, uh, by writing in the Q&A, and we can also discuss it later if you have time. And now I will turn uh, to Ravi, who is waiting for us at, in Boston, as I, as I can see at the Fletcher School, my, my old alma mater at Tufts University. And uh, Ravi is um, running a Digital Planet project um, at Fletcher School, and uh, they have already published some analysis about which countries are uh, you know, more ready and which countries are less ready to deal with the current uh, crisis. Uh, please, uh, Ravi, uh, screen is yours, and please turn on your mic. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Milos. The the green screen is is uh, is was primarily for you, uh, you know, uh, to give you the. Uh, the warm and fuzzies of the of the Fletcher Orange. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Ravi. I uh, I run a program called uh, Digital Planet uh, at uh, the Institute for uh, Business in the Global Context uh, at the Fletcher School. Uh, now, uh, uh, so I uh, our our work primarily looks at uh, how uh, countries, consumers, uh, and economies uh, and corporations are moving from uh, what you know what we know as uh, you know uh, a physical uh, existence to uh, you know to a digital future. And uh, many years ago, we started a a project looking at how uh, many of the information goods uh, you know uh, are are getting digitized, uh, but cash somehow has been very very stubborn in in getting digitized. Uh, the question we asked ourselves was, ourselves was why, and uh, we came up with uh, a a series of studies uh, on a variety of countries, uh, India, Mexico, and the United States, looking at the costs of cash. And that led us uh, to looking at how, uh, you know, economies around the world are moving from a physical uh, present to a digital future. Uh, and we started this program around uh, 2013, uh, and we started an index uh, called the Digital Evolution Index, uh, which, uh, like Martin said, 2008 is a very good point uh, in time to look at uh, the rise of the digital economy. We are uh, the start point of our research uh, is uh, 2008 as well. Uh, we look at about uh, now uh, going 10 years of uh, you know of uh, you know uh, various factors that uh, that form uh, you know the pillars of digital uh, competitiveness of economies. Uh, so uh, we did this twice: uh, once in 2014, the second in 2017, the third one is uh, you know. Uh, uh, is, is due very shortly, uh, and we're looking at about 80 economies this time around, uh, and looking at how they've been moving from, uh, you know, what we call a physical present to a digital future. Uh, in addition to that, what we also did in the fall of uh, 2019 was look at uh, the rise of digital platforms, uh, and uh, the question we again asked ourselves was, uh, you know, primarily uh, looking at uh, the World Bank's ease of doing uh, business, uh, and, and uh, you know, the ease of doing business, uh, you know, uh, its methodology being, you know, uh, famously having been questioned by uh, their own, uh, you know, chief economist, uh, is a uh, is a look at how easy it is to do business in the physical world, but it does not say much or anything at all about how easy or difficult it is to do business uh, to do any kind of digital business uh, or to set up any kind of digital platforms. Now we know technology is born global, uh, but it is still subject to any number of real world challenges. Uh, in, in in trying to uh, trying to uh, you know uh, as you as as these uh, platforms uh, try to uh, try to expand uh, into other markets, um, so we looked at four kinds of platforms uh, and the ease of doing uh, you know doing these uh, ease ease for these digital platforms around around about forty two countries in the world. Uh, we called it the ease of doing digital business. We looked at uh, e commerce platforms. Uh, we looked at digital media platforms like Netflix and. And, and so on and so forth. Uh, we looked at sharing economy platforms, and we looked at uh, online remote remote work of uh, uh, di digital freelancing uh, platforms. Uh, and that uh, you know, uh, and I'm happy to share links to uh, you know the reports and, and and articles and so on and so forth on that work. Now, as we looked at all of this, obviously the rise of remote work uh, became very germane to uh, what we're going through. Uh, as uh, you know, as a world today, uh, and and we are, uh, you know, uh, in in 
what, you know, as, as uh, others have, have just said, at a very extraordinary juncture uh, in global society, uh, you know, these are, uh, uh, we, are, we are facing what is probably, uh, you know, the most unprecedented challenge uh, of our generation. Uh, large swaths of the global economy are in virtual standstill mode. Global cooperation is at a standstill, which uh, is incredibly uh, unfortunate. And, uh, and, and uh, your countries are trying to navigate the grim calculus uh, of a trade-off between economic health and public health. Uh, and and uh, in, in, in many ways, digital technologies are the only tether holding uh, you know, uh, the economy and society together today in most parts of the world, including, uh, you know, uh, and, and, you know, and are, have, have become a vital service. Now, on the one hand, we can, you know, we, yes, uh, you know, uh, Amazon and, and, and other uh, platforms will uh, potentially become stronger coming out of this, but today they're also a crucial lifeline uh, uh, for, uh, for last mile delivery of groceries. Uh, you know, digital technologies are enabling contact tracing, uh, you know, isolating infection hotspots, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, for those of us who are still able to and are incredibly fortunate uh, to continue working in a digitally, in a physically distant yet socially connected mode, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, thanks to, uh, thanks to digital technologies, we are able to do that now. So what we did was we looked at which countries are, uh, you know, how countries are uh, performing in what we call is the great lockdown. Uh, allow me to share some slides right now. So this is work we are doing. Uh, uh, this is one of the first pieces of work that we've, uh, uh, that we've kicked off uh, under the umbrella of uh, what we call uh, IDEA 2030. It is Imagining a Digital Economy for All. Uh, it is a multi-year grant uh, from the MasterCard Impact Fund. Uh, the question we asked ourselves is, uh, which countries are ready for the great lockdown and which countries are uh, ready to ease up? Uh, uh, just focusing on that grim sort of calculus between uh, you know, economic health and uh, public health. So uh, what we found is that um, there are some countries uh, that are uh, that have demonstrated a strong epidemiological response and also have a strong digital readiness, which means that they are uh, able to perform in a lockdown. And what you see is New Zealand uh, in the in the far uh, in the in, in in one corner, obviously Estonia right up there, uh, and 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 a few other countries in Europe, uh, and. Another set of countries where uh, the epidemiological response was uh, somewhat weak, uh, but uh, the digital readiness is still very strong. And so in there, you have countries like Australia, Canada, uh, the United States, uh, and, 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 and a few other parts of Europe. A third set of interesting states are where the epidemiological response has been very strong, but uh, you know, their digital readiness is weak. Uh, and, and these are, you know, uh, and the, the big ones in there are, uh, are uh, you know, Italy, India, uh, parts of Southeast Asia, and uh, South Africa. And the last bucket of countries are, uh, you know, uh, are countries like Brazil uh, and, and a few others that have demonstrated both a weak epidemiological response and a weak, uh, you know, and, and also unfortunately suffer from a weak uh, digital readiness. Now, Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, your your classic four blocker look uh, at at, uh, at at where countries fall, um, uh, and uh, so as we looked at the question of countries uh, that are preparing to lift lockdowns, uh, we contrasted what we call epidemiological readiness uh, with uh, their sort of digital readiness. Uh, the the our, our thinking behind this is is that you know, um, this is not the last lockdown uh, that you know, even, uh, even as we, uh, as a global society, uh, you know, uh, uh, battle uh, the, the, the novel coronavirus, uh, you know, uh, as, as, we, as we all know, there will be, uh, and, and, you know, and, and we're all bracing ourselves for uh, and many rounds of what uh, is being called uh, the hammer and the dance, and there will be uh, this very delicate, uh, you know, balance between uh, trying to open up you know, 
and then probably pulling back a little bit. So in more ways than one, it would probably be, you know, two steps forward, one and a half steps back. Uh, and, and, and as we go through this, uh, you know, some kind of lockdown readiness uh, becomes extremely important. Uh, and not just that, uh, this kind of digital resilience, uh, you know, given that it is the only tether holding uh, the economy and society together today, uh, is, is perhaps uh, more important for our ability to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, to face future pandemics. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, and so that uh, is, the, is the sort of uh, guiding thinking behind, behind this. Uh, so we looked at a few countries. We looked at obviously New Zealand uh, and, and, you know, most of us, uh, at least, uh, you know, here uh, in the United States probably look at uh, New Zealand uh, with green eyed envy for, uh, you know, the tremendous leadership uh, that country has uh, and, uh, and, and lament uh, what we have uh, in, in, in our country here. Uh, so New Zealand, uh, as we look at, you know, various dimensions that shaped our, our, our uh, you know, uh, uh, our uh, measures of uh, epidemiological response and uh, lockdown, what we call lockdown digital re resilience and readiness. Uh, you get to see a pattern here, uh, you know, and we looked at measures such as, you know, how inclusive uh, is the internet in countries? What are the robustness or what is the robustness of digital platforms? What is the proliferation of digital payments in countries, given that, you know, uh, people are, you know, in, uh, you know, shut in and, and, and have no, uh, no way to, uh, you know, have any kind of face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, commercial exchange. Uh, what is the resilience of internet infrastructure, uh, you know, and on the epidemiological side, we looked at aspects such as testing and tracing, uh, change in mobility, uh, uh, you know, uh, workplaces, transit and retail, this is Google data, government stringency, this is data from uh, the Oxford Institute, uh, uh, you know, and the ability of governments to deliver digital public services online uh, with uh, the unfortunate number of debts around the world, uh, you know, a debt certificate uh, becomes extremely important at a time like this because that triggers any number of, uh, you know, insurance claims and so on and so forth. And uh, the ability of governments to even be able to deliver a debt certificate digitally becomes extremely important. And as some of you uh, probably have been following, uh, uh, Governor Cuomo uh, recently uh, announced uh, that, you know, uh, marriages can be officiated via Zoom. Uh, but, I mean, it's probably not news to, to the Estonians because in excess of about 95% of all public services, uh, you know, in Estonia can be delivered digitally. Uh, but it's a pretty big deal uh, in, in uh, stateside. Um, and so on and so forth. So these are uh, the measures that we put in to kind of get a, get a picture of what uh, you know, uh, what the epidemiological response is versus what the lockdown digital re readiness is. Uh, now, uh, that's New Zealand. Uh, and let me share where Germany is. And we picked a few countries just to kind of uh, give a flavor of how this kind of an analysis can be helpful in uh, looking at uh, uh, countries and their ability to uh, withstand uh, uh, many sequences of uh, uh, what we call the hammer on the dance. Uh, that's Germany's uh, sort of uh, footprint, and now uh, and now I'll I'll, I'll look at uh, I'll share with you another picture. Uh, this is South Korea, arguably one of the countries that has done extremely well in in you know in uh, in, uh, in 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 standing up to the uh, challenge. Um, that's South Korea, uh, and and this was. This is Norway. Uh, Estonia's Nordic neighbor. And another Nordic neighbor, Denmark. Slightly different patterns here, but you know, you can see already uh, between Norway and Denmark, uh, the, uh, the changes are primarily, while well, on most other measures, uh, they, do, they do pretty well. Their in internet infrastructure resilience is a little weaker uh, on, and uh, the government stringency has been, has been higher. So, uh, interesting sort of uh, uh, contrast between the two uh, uh, Scandinavian uh, neighbors there. And lastly, uh, this is the state of uh, the United States compared to some of these, uh, uh, some of these countries. Um, and that's where the United States stands. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, an evolving piece of work. Uh, we, we also are, are looking at, and, and I'm gonna quickly run through a few other, uh, you know, uh, 
dimensions that we are exploring. Uh, this was uh, this is an article we wrote in the Harvard Business Review. My colleague Bhaskar Chakravarti, uh, the dean of global business, and I, uh, on which countries are most prepared for a lockdown. Uh, and on the one hand, on the on the y-axis, what you have is the robustness robustness uh, of digital platforms. Uh, the same digital platforms that we talked about, e-commerce primarily, uh, remote working, and so on and so forth, and digital media. Uh, and on the x-axis, we looked at uh, internet infrastructure resilience and bandwidth, uh, the stress on the bandwidth in each country. Uh, and, on the, uh, and, and what you see uh, on, on the Z gradient is uh, the proliferation of digital payments. Uh, and it gives you a very interesting picture of where countries are and, and uh, on, 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 on a variety of these dimensions in terms of being able to sustain a, a, a lockdown. Uh, this is another dimension that we are, uh, you know, uh, in, in the process of exploring further. This is looking at uh, the state of uh, digital public services across countries and how inclusive and affordable internet is. Uh, you know, uh, and there aren't too many places in the world where uh, the internet is deemed to be a, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an essential utility or, or even a birthright. Uh, I think, I think uh, and, and Mila should keep me honest here, I think Finland and Estonia are two countries where it is deemed a, a uh, sorry, a, uh, a, 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 the, the right to internet is enshrined in the constitution. Now, uh, obviously, you know, uh, Estonia is right up there uh, in the Northeast, uh, quite the North Star in terms of being able to deliver digital public services, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, on, the, uh, on, on uh, the dimensions of inclusive and affordable internet. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, the color gradients, by the way, are, uh, are social distance readiness. Uh, and then when you look at, you know, some of the countries here, uh, Philippines and Indonesia and Brazil, uh, you know, have uh, a lot of distance to cover compared to some of their, uh, some of their other peers in the global south. Uh, and I will just share one more and then, uh, and then open it up for uh, any questions. This is how prepared our countries, uh, how prepared is the public sector for social distancing and how responsive have governments been? Uh, again, this is uh, looking at digital public services, inclusive and affordable internet, the same uh, two dimensions on the X and Y axes. Uh, but here, what we're looking at is what, is, what has the epidemiological response been? Uh, and here again, you, know, you see those countries uh, in uh, the Northeast, uh, of the of the grid, uh, you know, Estonia, uh, Norway, Singapore doing extremely well. Uh, I I will pause here, uh, and and I'd be happy to share. Uh, I'd be happy to share uh, uh, links to the articles that we've written, uh, and and would love any feedback, and happy to take any questions. All right, thanks so much, Ravi. And uh, one way to uh, ask questions and answer them is in our Q&A section, as we are sort of quite packed for this uh, uh, webinar, then uh, this is one of the best ways. And I see Martin already has answered to quite a lot of questions that, that have been asked there. So, but now uh, I would like to expand this debate. And we have been talking about business, we've been talking about public-private collaboration in the case of China, dominance of uh, uh, large uh, private platforms in the US, uh, but there is obviously uh, also a very important cybersecurity dimension. And I would like to give this opportunity to Merla to address uh, some of those issues because uh, obviously from the Estonian perspective and sort of perspective of a small, small, uh, small country in Central Eastern Europe, those issues are uh, vital. So please, Merla, um, screen is yours. Well, thank you very much, Melis. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me and, and giving the floor a um, fascinating discussion. Um, indeed, as, as was said before, I risk has forced uh, uh, offices and schools to close and the web remains our lifeline, allowing us to work and to educate our kids. We are told to work from home and stay away from others. And we thus uh, growingly uh, rely on the services offered uh, by the tech industry biggest companies, as uh, Professor Kenny, Kenny mentioned, uh, totally agree. We rely on uh, various digital platforms in getting news, in receiving education, uh, in holding conferences and webinars, apparently. Uh, in ordering food or, uh, or broadcasting. So what does this mean for the future uh, of, of global digital ecosystems? What can we, uh, what can we do about it? 
and the cybersecurity perspective. So I think I'll, I'd, I'd share a few thoughts on trust and data. Um, trust, because as we build systems or, uh, or use them, or as we make sure that the systems that we, are, we have built remain resilient, we need to ensure that they are trustworthy as well as effective. Trust is uh, vitally important uh, to all of us. We have to be able to trust one another in the society. We have to be able to trust our institutions, both government and corporate. And we have to be able to uh, trust the technological systems that make our society function. So how can we generate trust as uh, we see these developments outlined and, and accelerated by the uh, COVID-19, the, uh, the growth of the platform companies and, um, and, and how does work, how does that work with, uh, with trying to, to trust them more? A lot of the answers to that, questions, uh, to that question, I believe, circle around data and data security. I uh, totally agree uh, with uh, Professor Kenny, um, um, uh, believing that data is the new oil. Um, that uh, that, uh, that um, metaphor has been uh, used uh, several times um, before. I would um, uh, question whether uh, it is the algorithms um, that are machines of uh, refining the oil or whether it's something else. I, I would add to that, that if we believe that data is the oil, um, um, maybe the digital platforms uh, can be the uh, new oil pipelines as they are uh, the new intermediaries um, growingly. Uh, but, but clearly without refinery, there is no creation of value. And I would suggest that the refinery that can be created um, is rules that and take the storage and use of data. This is the uh, refinery. This is something that governments need to do, uh, which in turn really is a list of uh, things that uh, citizens need to demand their governments to do. Um, it can be done at national level, um, but also in Europe, it can and has been done at the EU level. And the results affect uh, corporations uh, and digital platforms. So three thoughts on this. Um, first, I believe for more trust and security, uh, data collection needs to be regulated. This is not new because protective, uh, prospective employers, for example, are not allowed to ask whether women are pregnant. Um, loan applications are not allowed to ask about our race. Um, because of legacy, European governments can be sensitive about the kind of data they, as governments, can collect. But we also need to start discussing what sorts of data should never be collected by the private sector. It should not be a condition of having a cell phone that we subject ourselves to constant surveillance. And this discussion has, of course, become at this, more at the center of our uh, radar screens with the, with the current uh, COVID, uh, COVID um, disease tracking discussion. Um, our associations to whom we communicate, whom we meet on the street should not be continually monitored. Right now, there is no down downside to collectible data and privately owned platforms end up uh, saving pretty much everything. But by forcing or suggesting that they, uh, the companies uh, should come clean with customers about what they actually collect and what they do with it, we will influence them to collect and save only the data about us that they know is valuable. Ideally, uh, the principle should be to collect the minimum data needed and keep it for the minimum time needed. And of course, uh, to store it as, as securely as can be done. We also would need independent, strong, uh, preferably national data protection agencies to help this. Secondly, I suggest to think about how to regulate data use. Much of the information that's collected about us is collected because we want it to be. We object when the is being used in ways we do not intend to, when it is stored or shared 
or sold or co-related and used to actually manipulate us. What comes to mind with this uh, is election manipulation and dark ads on social platforms, for example, during Brexit or the uh, US presidential elections. This means that we need restrictions on how our data can actually be used and we need more transparency when looking at the future or, and asking what, what can be done. Many algorithms can be public or they can be redesigned so that they become public. And also there are ways of auditing algorithms by neutral third parties for fairness uh, without making them public. Uh, in the EU, there are now broad privacy protection laws in place. And these are rules that are set uh, and cannot be eroded actually. In Estonia, people own their own data. But the question is how can these issues be raised more generally? My third and final point is uh, about focusing more on data security and cybersecurity. A way to improve the security of collected data is to make companies and platforms rely liable for data breaches. Right now, the cost of insecurity is really low. One example that comes to mind is related to Equifax breach back in 2017. Equifax, a US credit bureau, headquartered in Atlanta, which maintains a massive repository of consumer information that it sells then to businesses looking to verify identities or assess credit worthiness. Um, a few months ago in February 2020, as a result of one of the largest hacks in history to target consumer data, four members of Chinese military were charged with breaking in uh, into the Equifax computer networks and stealing the personal information of roughly 145 million Americans. Yet the Equifax scandal was entirely avoidable. They were warned for months in advance about their server vulnerability that made the possible. Data collected by the company was acquired without really consumer consent or uh, and with no ability for consumers to opt out. So what uh, true consequences were there for the company uh, for this obscene negligence um, i would i would argue that not much so by, by raising the cost of privacy breaches we can make companies accept the costs of the externality and force them to spend more effort protecting the privacy of those whose data they have acquired there is a parallel um, with how environmental pollution is regulated Factories today have legal obligations to limit the poison they, they push out into the environment. And if they exceed these limits, they are subject to fines. There is no need to wait until an unexpected surge of uh, cancer cases. The problem is understood. The regulations are in place and the same should be applied to the entities uh, storing our data. Of course, the making, uh, uh, making of these secure systems, making these systems more secure will cost money, but making companies liable for breaches move those costs from users and people to companies and as a byproduct causes um, every, uh, the, the companies to improve their security. So to sum up, we, um, when looking ahead, when looking into the future, um, we definitely see the power of platforms increasing. I believe that uh, when looking into the future from the Estonian perspective, there, uh, there certainly is uh, and needs to be interaction, interaction, interaction between the government-owned platforms, uh, platform in Estonian case, the X Road, and various different uh, privately-owned platforms. Mm. When looking into the future, we do not know what sorts of interventions are coming up and what major human problems they will be able to solve. The trick is, um, will be to maximize the benefits that come from both government and privately owned platforms collecting, storing and analyzing our data while also minimizing the harms. So um, I'll stop here, conscious of the time and remain open to questions as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Merla.
And uh, again, uh, yeah, questions could be asked also in Q&A. I've also launched a uh, you know, short uh, survey poll uh, on some of the topics that we have uh, discussed here. But now uh, I would like to give a floor to Andre, who has been uh, waiting and uh, listening to all those presentations. Thanks so much for joining us. And I guess now it's opportunity for you to reflect on some of those uh, the topics and themes that have been discussed. So please, uh, screen is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. Actually, really uh, uh, great presentations. I will uh, uh, also try to show mine. Um, so here we go. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so basically, uh, I'll try to be really short. Uh, there are uh, three topics uh, I would like to outline based on uh, your presentation. The uh, first is mine. Uh, so uh, the uh, first thing uh, that is an issue for uh, us here in Estonia, I guess, is uh, uh, the question of uh, uh, so-called uh, lifetime learning. Uh, in uh, some 10 years, uh, uh, we will lose about half of uh, our workplaces here in Estonia or here in the European Union. Uh, and uh, this, those workplaces will basically go to robots. As uh, uh, Kai mentioned, uh, uh, the current situation uh, uh, is not the only fault, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, pandemic actually speeded the process uh, uh, well up. And uh, it doesn't mean, of course, that uh, all those people will become uh, jobless, but uh, instead it means that uh, they will have to find uh, some uh, other challenges in, uh, in some other areas. And uh, uh, actually young people nowadays, those who finish high school, uh, will have to uh, change, uh, uh, change the... Uh, uh, a second. Can you hear me actually? Okay, cool. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, great. So, well, very well, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, children who uh, finish high school will have to switch the specialties uh, several times per uh, uh, their lifetime, and uh, we are not uh, quite ready for that. When, say, an energy sector is uh, shutting down in some region, uh, we don't have any efficient. Uh, uh, so-called uh, emergency retraining uh, system in place. And uh, this is the, uh, what we have to address uh, uh, basically right now, because uh, right now our economy is uh, uh, undergoing uh, serious uh, trans uh, transformation. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is actually connected to the first one. Uh, our current taxation approach is uh, more than 100, 100 uh, years old. Uh, for Estonia, for example, we uh, uh, about a third of our state budget is coming from uh, social tax, which is uh, basically um, a salary taxation. And uh, that was totally fine uh, 100 years ago, uh, when uh, uh, all the value add in the economy was created by the workers, as you know, uh, Karl Marx said. But uh, <clears throat> as uh, uh, as uh, Martin Kenney said, uh, the uh, capitalism is actually undergoing uh, uh, some changes and uh, the value is not great by uh, people that much anymore. Uh, so in some countries, uh, most of the value is created by the platforms or by, uh, let's say, computers, by AA. Uh, and uh, the issue is that we actually can't tax uh, robots yet all platforms efficiently. Uh, efficiently. Uh, we try to work on some initi initiatives uh, like, you know, digital tax, uh, but uh, those are uh, peanuts, basically. Uh, if we uh, go on like that, then uh, governments will run out of tax income uh, pretty fast and money will stay uh, with the large uh, corporations, which is, not, uh, which is not a bad thing per se, uh, but that's, that's a different world. Uh, I'm sure that we are ready for that right now. And uh, the last thing uh, is that uh, uh, despite you know, running out of money, <clears throat> the governments are 
uh, still willing to take more uh, control over uh, people behavior and which is you know pretty natural when uh, a disease strikes but afterwards uh, uh, this may become uh, a new normality uh, governments are so far uh, less successful comparing to the companies that uh, own service platforms like google facebook or uh, even amazon uh, i'm not quite uh, uh, i can't quite agree with kai who mentioned that uh, there should be uh, or, uh, governments and uh, uh, private sector uh, are uh, starting to cooperate. It's still some sort of a competition and uh, <clears throat> solutions like uh, uh, social credit system in China, for example, are becoming more and more appealing uh, to the general audience in uh, Western societies. And the, the idea is that uh, governments are willing to propagate and uh, sort of say, uh, acceptable social behavior among citizens in exchange for uh, some benefits or uh, value adds and this is uh, this sounds like a, a huge opportunity for uh, privacy issues uh, when governments gather and uh, uh, utilize data but uh, again in some cases this may actually help to become countries to be more uh, democratic uh, which may happen, you know, to the countries that are not, you know, an example of democracy uh, at this point. Uh, but that's a totally different big topic. And uh, during discussion, I would like to, I would, I would love to address uh, some specific uh, Estonian questions if we uh, have some time for that. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Andre, for those comments. Uh, so uh, and now it's uh, we have a brief time for discussion. Actually, uh, about ten minutes or so. I've also launched a poll. Uh, people can answer some of those uh, themes are reflected also uh, in this survey. Um, I'll, I will come back to Martin. Uh, uh, Martin. Um, you ended your uh, presentation by saying that we will, as a result of COVID and uh, also previous developments, will have sort of increased market uh, concentration. Large private platforms uh, will increase their dominance. Now we also have heard some uh, other perspectives. Uh, Andre was uh, uh, concerned about governments um, um, sort of collecting too much data sort of governments regulating um, and inf enforcing those platforms to give data away. Uh, Kai was talking about, in the case of China, sort of public-private uh, collaboration. Um, so are there also sort of alternative developments possible, particularly in terms of sort of next, I don't know, 10, 15 years, might there be a backlash against large American platforms and governments will become more eager to regulate them, will try to break them up, uh, well, this is a very popular theme here in Europe, in countries like France, but we've also seen that in the US, in a democratic presidential, um, um, uh, among uh, presidential candidates, you know, Elizabeth Warren and others have been talking about breaking up some of the big platforms. Uh, so, so maybe you would like, to, would you, you know, you could reflect on some of those points that have been made here um, and obviously sort of cybersecurity concerns. And, uh, and I'm thankful that you already answered quite a lot of questions we have got in Q&A. So yeah, please, uh, floor is yours. So as a Californian and West Coaster, let's not break them up. I'm in a public university and the tax dollars coming to me are very important. So hooray for the platforms. Um, they should take more, extract more wealth out of Europe, not less. We need it here. Uh, that's being sarcastic, uh, obviously. Um, so, I don't think thus far that the Europeans, uh, their privacy is, it's very nice. It, it, I don't think it has impacted the profits of these firms at all. So I think that uh, what may come out of this is uh, thinking about different ownership patterns. I mean, uh, is private ownership of this infrastructure, because these are infrastructure today, uh, the best way to go. 
uh, you could think of them as public utilities and regulate them that way. Or you could say, no, they should be more like the old uh, PTTs of 30, 40 years ago that have now been deregulated. Um, I think those are probably the more likely discussions. I think given the way the platforms are organized and their power, public utility regulation is sort of the, the easiest step. But I think Europe sort of uh, trying to mandate various things out of, um, out of Brussels has been largely unsuccessful and has not changed the dynamics of these platforms, has not changed their profitability, um, uh, and has not changed their power. Uh, uh, the Chinese case is, is, is very different uh, because of the, the role of the state uh, is so much more powerful there. So, um, so I think unless more radical ideas are put on the table, the dynamics and the nature of the European and the US and let's say rest of world outside of China uh, is such that the, the platforms are unlikely to be controlled and the march to greater power uh, is likely to continue. <laughs> that's a, and that's not completely negative. I mean, look at how much we like Google, uh, look at how much we like YouTube, uh, or f I'm not a Facebook person, but Facebook, or use LinkedIn. So, so it's this dynamic between innovation and providing people with what they want or think they want and uh, the nature of the economics of platforms and how they centralize power. It's a bad answer, but I think unless you think of something quite radical, it's unlikely to make change very much, except at the margins, at the margins change. Uh, Ravi, you would like to comment on that as well, and I understand Merle as well would like to comment on that. So. I guess we will end with those comments, so try to keep them brief because we only have about uh, five minutes left. Uh, uh, so please, Ravi, the uh, floor is yours. Well, if there are, you know, because we have to talk about silver linings given the, given the clouds that are, you know, uh, that we see everywhere around us, uh, technologies are probably the only, uh, only silver linings, they're the only tether, like I, like I said a little while ago. And, and uh, I think the way, the way you're looking at platforms may differ uh, significantly, you know, depending on where you where you stand, uh, you know, uh, uh, Europe may look at them differently. The United States looks at them differently. Uh, Europe is in more ways than one ahead on some of some very uh, crucial aspects, such as making sure that the internet is regulated as a utility. Uh, we still have debates here in the United States about whether it is a utility or a luxury, depending on which government is in uh, is in uh, is in power. Uh, so you've solved some of those issues now. As far as platforms are concerned and what that, you know, uh, the, the issue here is, uh, you know, you have to think about the immense amount of value that these platforms are creating. Uh, and and you, you also want uh, to, to be able to allow these platforms to, to create that kind of value. Uh, case in point, uh, the Nordics are, uh, you know, lead the world in terms of, uh, you know, uh, subscription video on demand, uh, you know, uh, consumption pretty much around the world. They are the most oversubscribed on pretty much every digital media platform there is. So Europe could, you know, very well tax that consumption if it wants to, given how much of that consumption, digital consumption is happening. I see no reason why uh, platforms ought to be regulated any more than they are. I think they're providing right now, at least, they're providing a tremendous uh, service, an essential service, if you will, at least compared to a hundred years ago when our ancestors, I can't even imagine how they, how they dealt with the Spanish flu without Netflix, uh, you know, uh, but- What? You no. Know. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'll turn my microphone off. All right. Thank you. Uh, Merla, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, 
two quick comments. I remain uh, uh, I, on a different opinion about the power of Europe, about the normative power of Europe. Uh, while uh, I and I think its success doesn't show in whether or not the big platforms, the Google, Amazon, um, and others. Um, become less or more powerful, but the European normative power expresses itself first and foremost in um, affecting the legislation of its member states. And when I say that, I'm thinking of the European um, General Directive of the uh, um, of the Protection of uh, of uh, Privacy (GDPR), as well as the Network Information Security Directive that has created very concrete sets of requirements for the member states' governments regarding essential service providers and their uh, cyber security. So, um, the, so, so Europe definitely has, has power to say how its member states um, interact and, and through various rules and regulations, but beyond that also to entities that want to do business within Europe. Mm. Secondly, I notice that one, and, and I, 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 I believe that one of the effects of the current virus, while indeed the power of big platforms does increase, um, countries uh, and, at national level can take a careful uh, look and rethink uh, whether when they develop their national priorities, they want to become dependent on big platforms. I'm thinking, for example, Estonia now that has really uh, undergone this great experience of digital education. And um, for two, three months, our, all of our kids have been dependent on various on various online services, but also including various platforms. And the question is, when we further develop them, do we want this education, which is crucial of importance of, for our future, remain dependent on how Zoom or um, we Teams or WebEx develops. So I think that more and more as we see countries uh, are reviewing their rules of, uh, of how, how dependent in, in the critical fields they are on platforms and also reviewing rules of foreign investments in critical technologies, in infrastructure and sensitive personal data. Thanks. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, I will just uh, quickly, quickly summarize our uh, poll uh, responses. So we have a uh, response rate is 64%. Uh, uh, most people believe that uh, uh, large private platforms will dominate um, in the future, uh, but there is also pretty strong support uh, for public-private platforms. Um, uh, also concerning COVID-19, they think that it will benefit the large uh, private uh, platforms, but there is also quite strong support for the uh, idea that it forces private and uh, government platforms to cooperate more. Who will win the technology wars? It's actually very even, equal. 41, 41 percent both, uh, one, uh, one for China, 41 for China, and 41 for <laughs> US, uh, and there is a 3 percent uh, support for Europe, uh, and uh, yeah, and, uh, and so on. And, uh, um, and basically concerning policy issues, uh, uh, um, I guess um, most people said that some of the issues that were raised in this question, Huawei, Chinese consumer apps, Chinese investments uh, should concern your European policymakers. Uh, uh, the idea that none of them should concern, uh, be a concern for the policymakers, uh, got only 9%. And um, basically, how can Europeans be better in this uh, global platform competition? And the, the highest uh, ranking answer is that we have to find sort of unique European approach rather than adopt the US or Chinese uh, style model. And uh, I just throw, I was throwing out there one question about Estonian digital platforms because some of them have run into difficulties such as Bolt and, uh, and so on. Uh, I guess uh, most people here answered that uh, it depends, 65%, uh, but uh, people who supported uh, help to those Estonian unicorns, um, they had uh, one third, 35% um, uh, of, the, and no was only 3%. So I will end the polling now, uh, and uh, I will share the results with all of you that you can check it. Um, and I would like to thank all our panelists. Um, we recorded this uh, webinar. We will post it to the YouTube. Uh, you can rewatch it there.
Um, uh, I'm really sorry, but today actually the collaboration between two platforms, Zoom and Facebook, uh, didn't work out. For some reason, I was not able to live stream it on the Facebook uh, as we have done before. Um, I have no idea why, why that uh, didn't work, but um, hopefully you will be able to rewatch it on YouTube. And uh, so in that sense, it shouldn't be an issue. So thanks again. Thanks to the participants. Thanks, thank you to the panelists. And I hope to see you around. So have a, have a good evening, uh, have a good morning in California. I don't know, uh, Guy, have a good night in Chengdu. Uh, yeah, have a good afternoon in Boston, Ravi. Thanks for joining us. So um, yeah, see you around, bye.